In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. Introducing St. Jude Flashpoint. We don't get to choose what happens to us, but we do get to choose how we let it affect us. Rate, review, and subscribe to St. Jude Flashpoint. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian, and welcome to The Sidebar, a weekly show on arts, culture, and anything in between. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Robert Gordon, whose book about Memphis and Memphis music, It Came From Memphis, has been updated and re-released in a new edition. I'm also joined by Chris Harrington, writer for The Daily Memphian. Robert, uh, you you are an Emmy and Grammy Award-winning writer, producer, director, uh, author of six books, producer, director of eight feature documentaries, um, quoting your own website, focused on the American South, its music, art, and politics. You're also a host of a show here on WYXR, if you're listening to this on the radio station versus the podcast. WYXR 91.7, your show is the Idle Hour, every Tuesday from 3 to 4. Thanks for joining me. Oh, yeah. I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm a big fan of this station. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's good. And and another uh, uh, person, another person with a show on this station is Chris Harrington. Uh, also a writer for The Daily Memphian who writes about culture, the Grizzlies, food, politics every once in a while, um, and of course music. Um, his show on WYXR 91.7 is Sings All Kinds every Thursday at 4 to 5. So Chris, thanks for coming on and co-hosting or co-interviewing with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, glad to have you. I've done double duty on Jennifer's show and my show on Thursdays. So it'll That's be right. a di- yeah. different double duty, although yeah. I've done yours before too. That's true. That's true. Um, so Robert, we'll start with the basics. Um, first for people who don't know about, it came from Memphis before we get to the reissue and the update and how this all came about. What, what, what is it? How do you describe your, your, your book? Um, it's, it's shines a little bit of light in the dark underground of Memphis music. And one thing that's changed over the 25 years is that that dark underground has become a lot less dark. The uh, things in Memphis that are, um, you know, that are, that are beyond Elvis and Al Green. um, They've drawn a lot more attention in the past quarter century. And um, uh, that makes me pleased. And so so this is about those people that, that music and sort of the circumstances of the city racially in a lot of ways that made that music happen. Yeah, and, and it, the, the book originally came out, the first edition was 95, am I right about that? 1995, yeah. And what changed, you know, in terms of this re-release, you, you, you write about it in the, in the foreword, but just, I mean, what, when you looked back at it and you have the chance to re-release it, you did go through and update some things yes. and add some things. How, what was that like and, and what seemed like it really needed to either be edited or added to or whatever? Um, well, first of all, there were just some facts I'd gotten wrong, uh, over, you know, that over time, uh, the box tops came to me and gave me corrections and, uh, different people. So I just had some, some mistakes to correct, but more importantly, um, I'd gotten a letter, uh, from Linda Crossway for Terry immediately after publication. That's at a time when everybody was approaching me and saying, Hey man, your book's really good, but I should be in it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and 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 so I didn't I, do I didn't do that, Robert. In full <laughs> fairness, I did not did not come to you and say so. I just want lots of people were doing it, but her the letter made a case that um, that it was a guy's book to large extent, and that I'd overlooked the role of of um, women on the scene. And in my defense, you know, I had two or more lead characters who were women in the book one of whom is featured on the cover of the new edition um and and but but her 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 point made a a lot of sense so when i had the opportunity to go back and do new interviews i concentrated on some of the wives because the book focuses on you know it grows out the, the sort of central question to me was how did the young white bohemian hippies assume the mantle of the old black blues players. How did the, how did the blues get handed down? I wanted to know like 
physical places people were where they exchanged information and where ideas were exchanged. Um, and so a lot of that was, was the, the, a lot of those musicians, most of those musicians were guys, but uh, Linda's letter made me contemplate the scene in a more holistic and deeper way. And so I interviewed about a half dozen or more uh, women and I just folded them into the book. The, the great thing about this new edition was it was an all new layout. So I could do as much rewriting as I wanted. I didn't want to change a whole lot because it'd been in print for a quarter century. Something was right, you know? Uh, so, um, but that was sort of the biggest change was to, uh, was to get a few more disparate voices in there. I mean, to incorporate new material into the main flow of the book is a lot of work. And, and that's a deliberate choice. I mean, clearly you made, um, you know, when a book gets reissued like this, the most obvious thing to do is add a new chapter and, and bulk up the notes in the appendix with both of which you do, but you could have all the new, new material could have gone there and not into the, into the flow of the, the main structure of the book? Why was it important to you to sort of do the extra work of, of doing it that way? Uh, I think I've got a career that that shows I, I've not taken the easy way on, on a whole lot of things, you know? And I just felt like the book would be better. I felt like this edition of the book is going to stand, you know? Um, part of my agreement with Third Man. The, the problem I'd had was that Simon & Schuster you know, the major publisher was publishing it as a lightning press book. It looked like uh, it was being printed on a photocopier that was low on toner. <laughs> so, you know, I made a deal. And part of this deal with third man books is that it will, uh, it will, you know, that lightning press does not count as in print. So this one will, as long as it's in print, it'll look good. Um, so I wanted to, I didn't want to just tack on this extra stuff it was integral, you know, and I wanted to integrate it. Um, and it was harder, uh, but, you know, it's my first book and it's kind of my baby and you want your baby to go out dressed right. <laughs> well, I mean, I wonder if that decision consciously or not is related to what the structure of the book really is. I mean, it came from Memphis is a book, you know, a book I've known since it was published. I don't know if it was published in 95 or written in 95, but you know, mid nineties, right? 35, yeah. Right. And so, I mean, people, people who have only read it and not written it, like know it for what it is, but you, you had to make choices on the front end for it to be what it is. And, and I, I'm struck by, you know, the original foreword is by Peter Goronik, mm -hmm. um, who, you know, I discovered his books in high school and I read all those, those first few books. And if you look, if you go back to those books, which I assume were influential to you, Definitely. you know, A Lost Highway, It Felt Like Going Home are basically a series of portraits mm -hmm. and sweet soul music is more of a total story that sort of goes by in episodes. Mm -hmm. It seems to me it came from Memphis could have gone either way and it went a little bit more of the sweet soul music route. I mean, and from, from the, I assume that was a conscious decision in terms of how you chose to structure it in yeah. the beginning. Right. Yeah. It's kind of funny that, that, that you're observing that because in a, uh, in a big way, a book I published two years ago, I see as a bookend to it came from Memphis. That book is called Memphis Rent Party, and it's structured like you're saying, episodic. It's it's a series of portraits, and my new introductions to each of those portraits kind of gives the whole book a cohesive flow. Um, and that was actually my original vision for It Came From Memphis. I, I would go into bookstores as a fan of Jim Dickinson and Sid Selvage and Furry Lewis and Alex Chilton. In the, in the 80s and 90s, I was going into bookstores and looking in the in the indexes of books for um, you know those guys, and they weren't there. So I realized, oh, I've got all this information. I should just compile my essays, my 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 interviews, even my raw interviews, because you know a lot of these people are really fun fun to talk to, and you just want to hear their raw words. Um, so I thought I'll just collect a series of uh, of these individual essays. Um, but as I got into it. I realized that this was much more interconnected and that there was a bigger story to tell. And that was really exciting for me because it made the first book a real book as opposed to a collection. And it let me look forward to ultimately putting together uh, Memphis Rent Party, which was an execution of the original vision I had. 
one thing, uh, we, we're here, I should say, with uh, Robert Gordon, the uh, writer, uh, producer, director, as well as Chris Harrington from uh, the, um, <laughs> the Daily Memphian. Um, and this is The Sidebar on WYXR every uh, Thursday at 1130. Um, we also are a podcast on the Daily Memphian side. And if you came in late, you can get an archive of this interview on the WYXR site, or you can do it over on uh, Daily Memphian. One thing you wrote... Um, I think uh, it was your part of your forward that that uh, that a whole genre devoted to the Memphis underground has developed since '95, and yeah. it, it is funny to think about. Um, just uh, you know, the, the I think you talk about going into a record store back in the '80s and '90s and finding the book section that had these cool books about places. For me, I grew up in Tacoma, Washington, a big blue collar town. You know, the only exposure I had to music was album or it, was, it wasn't called uh, classic rock then. It was album oriented rock. And so there'd be these big compendiums of the British new wave and the British first wave. And and you would go. And it's funny what you just said about the index. You turn to the back and, you yeah. know, was there a reference to the kinks or some secret yeah. history of Jimmy Page or something like that? <laughs> and, and and so for people who are listening now, as we date ourselves, this notion that you can go to Wikipedia or you can go to a site, you can find all this stuff. That was not. It just wasn't possible then. So I, yeah. I'm curious when you look, reading back at the book, look how it, this wealth of information we now have available, did that somehow influence how you approach this or, or Memphis rent party? Um, well, the, the, the lack of that wealth of information uh, meant that when I was doing this book originally, it's a lot of firsthand information interviews you know I, I did a lot of interviews and a lot of transcribing of of interviews which i highly recommend for anyone starting out you know go interview the man on the street or the woman on the street or your favorite musician or whatever and transcribe that interview and you'll learn a lot about how you talk to people and how they answer um but so I, so the original book is really you know it is heavily uh firsthand information one one more important factor to point out about the timing of the book um i think the book you know I, I was well into writing the book when the replacement song called alex chilton uh came out and over the years i've realized what a touchstone that was for a lot of people that you know there were people in the uh 90s who were who who were very much into college rock and the replacements but had no idea of the deeper um sources so their song began to open up that world at, just before my book came out and i think they kind of worked in tandem to introduce or to reintroduce big star to the public at 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 large well, I mean, and to me, that that way, the timing of the book is, is fascinating in terms of when it was written, because in some ways, it's a book that looks backward initially, other than at the very end where you get yeah. to the present. But it's a book that sort of is documenting this past, but it's almost written at a moment. I don't know if it's, if it's the end of it or it's it's a moment of pivot because it's right before the Internet. Right. Yeah. Um and, and so this explosion that happened after, which from a local standpoint, I think the book partly feeds into makes it easier to, to to go back into the past, but it feels like maybe it changed the present in a way. It made it harder. You're documenting a very localized, specific, you know, culture. And it seems like you're documenting it at a moment when, you know, that sort of singularity or, or, or localized aspect starts to change. Like, you know, in the mid nineties, we still thought of music genres and record labels connected to cities, in a way that I don't think we do as much anymore because of the internet. Um, I'm sort of rambling, but, but I mean, I assume you felt sort of that, that it was at this moment of pivot and yeah. part of what you're doing with the new material is you're sort of playing a flag in the ground to sort of maintain this local distinctiveness. Right. <laughs> I like to think so. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing I was aware of as I was writing the book was the death of re regionality. Right. right. Some of the early right in the early chapter, it talks about how, you know, certain locales have always had certain histories. The light in California, you know, is conducive to filmmaking. Um, uh, hot peppers grow in 
uh, alongside seafood ponds in Louisiana, you know, physical traits were associated with the industry of physical places. And that was one of the things I was contemplating was, you know, what makes Memphis, Memphis. And I, I don't know that I answered it. I kind of hope I didn't. I, I hope I, I raised a lot of potential answers, you know, because I don't think there's any one correct answer. But, um, but yeah, the strong sense of place was key to the motivation of, of the book. And I got to say, on the other hand, that, and I kind of wrote it intentionally, not for a local audience, you know, I didn't, I assumed people wouldn't have heard of Jim Dickinson, you know, and so I would try to contextualize these people in, in the larger sense, and also with an emphasis on how Memphis affected the national and international scene. But it was the world I knew, you know, it was the Antenna Club, it was Trader Dicks, it was Overton Square, you know, it was the Shell and the Schlitz Music Festival on, on the Mid-America Mall, you know, all those things were particular and kind of unexceptional to me because they were the things I knew. So it was, it was a real awakening and surprise, you know, it was what I hoped for that, that this book about local people doing local things in a national way would reach a national audience, you know, but it was a real, it was, a, I was surprised at how well it did and, 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 and the longevity it's had. Let me do let me do a quick uh, break here to remind everyone that this is the sidebar airing every Thursday at ninety one point seven WYXR at eleven thirty. Uh, we're focused on arts and culture and everything in between. It's not just a radio show; it's one of many weekly podcasts we do at the Daily Memphian, including the Behind the Headlines podcast as well as Bill Dree's politics podcast, a number of sports podcasts that Chris Harrington here uh, participates in, and Jennifer Biggs' food podcast, Sound Bites, which also airs here on WYXR every Thursday at eleven. All of our podcasts are on the Daily Memphian site, as well as iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And you can get past episodes at wyxr.org. And now a quick message from our sponsors. Introducing St. Jude Flashpoint. We don't get to choose what happens to us, but we do get to choose how we let it affect us. Rate, review, and subscribe to St. Jude Flashpoint. Let me go. I think I interrupted you, Chris. Let me go back to you. Yeah, I mean, you brought up Jim Dickinson, and I, and that's something I was interested in asking about. It, it, if, if this book has a main character, and it may not have one, but if it does, it might be Jim Dickinson, right? Yes. No, certainly Dick, certainly, so. Yeah, certainly Dickinson and the Mud Boy crew. And, and so one of the things that's interesting to me about it is it's sort of documenting the Memphis version of sort of a cultural transformation that was really happening all over the country, or at least in cities all over the country in the 70s, where this sort of bohemian transformation where you went from sort of folk revival, blues revival, hippie stuff. And by the end of the seventies, you're into more punk alternative culture. And it feels like, and maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like a lot of places around the country that was sort of an out with the old in with the new. Whereas in Memphis, like Dickinson is both, right? He is both the folk revival blues revival guy. And then he's the godfather of the punk scene. And, and I'm wondering if that idea of there's a through line between these two subcultures, like how important was that to you or how conscious was that to you? And whether you think that was something that's a product of the place or to what degree that's something that people like Dickinson and Salvage and those guys like fostered based on who they were. Uh, definitely both. I would, I guess, you know, um, Jim used to say, if you're not on the edge, you're taking up too much room. And, and so I think that, you know, artistically, he kept himself uh, on the crest of, of the wave. So, uh, and, and, but I think he was inspired to do that by being aware that the edge in Memphis is where Furry Lewis was, that the edge in Memphis is where a lot of the great art that the city had produced had been dispensed to, you know, it was things like things that weren't popular lived a long life on the edge. And Jim was playing the long game. You know, he was never interested in the hit, but, but he had, he had a, a great saying. Uh, let's see if I can call it up. Hits are in baseball. 
let's see, fair is where the pigs race, hits are in baseball, and your royalty lives in a castle in England, um, which is a pretty cynical view of an industry that's based on, you know, having big hits that appeal to a, a lot of people. Uh, uh, but I think that Memphis inspired that propensity to stay on the edge. And Dickinson was certainly a main character in the book. I, I as a kid in Memphis, growing up reading Walter Dawson in the commercial appeal, that's how I got to know Jim. Jim was the best quote guy, you know, ever in, in those columns. So, and then I saw Jim on stage a few times and, you know, there was, he nearly caused a riot down at the, uh, at an early Memphis uh, Beale Street Blues Festival. So when I read Jim in Peter Goralnik's Sweet Soul m m Music, somehow that gave me the impetus to call Jim and do my own interview. You know, I, I guess I felt like, oh, Peter at the time, uh, but I felt like, if, I don't know, it made him approachable in, in, in some kind of way. So, and that's where the book began. And that's actually the, where the, uh, where Memphis Rent Party also sort of begins. Um, that very first interview, I, I went to Jim's house, 1984, I think it was. I recall that to drive there, you had to go on a, a levee and on both sides there was a pond and on the way back I, I i i felt like i'd been through some kind of baptism you know that like interviewing jim for four hours in at his home in hernando mississippi had what it had actually done was it had told me that this crazy kind of world that i was viewing from the audience did exist that these that these people and, and these ideas were connected what they uh, uh first how did he almost chart start a riot you got to finish that that part of the story you can't mud boy in. and the neutrons take the stage uh one afternoon at uh a 1970 i'm gonna say seven Bill, uh bill street music festival it was the second year they'd done it on beale and they came out there and uh, started playing, I think, a Chuck Berry song, and they had they had their dancers, uh, Marsha Hare, now Misty Lavender, and uh, Connie, and the two of them were shaking it, you know, in front of a family event, what the city had imagined <laughs> to be a family event, and so uh, they pulled the plug on Mud Boy, and Mud Boy was upset. And and all of their crew came out on stage. Uh, Randall Lyon was out there shouting, "Beale Street is racism," and uh, and they were you know putting their fists in the air. And the crowd was it was it was mid afternoon. You know, beer had been flowing at the festival. The crowd yeah, was getting right. un unruly. It was, you know, I was a teenager and it was, I was like, wow, man, listen to the power of this music. You know, look yeah. at what it's done to this crowd. One really notable thing in the book is that, um, you, and you, you said something earlier about the world. This was the world I knew and didn't, and I'm going to paraphrase you poorly saying that, you know, it wasn't as exceptional maybe because it was what you knew. Right. But there's also the, the stories of bringing blues musicians to school to play yeah. at lunch. Yeah. I mean, and, and the, there's maybe the tell people who haven't read the book, the anecdote about seeing this musician at a, at a Rolling Stones concert yeah. and then bringing them to school. Can you tell that? When, so my sort of initial entry into this world occurred at a Rolling Stones concert, July 4th, 1975 Liberty Bowl stadium. Um, you know, it was an all day event, Charlie Daniels and three other bands. And, and, and all the warm-up bands had finished, and it was like, I don't know, five in the afternoon, six in the afternoon, midsummer, you know. The, the, the Stones, not being from here, thought it was going to cool off at dark. So they, <laughs> they, they were going to wait until dark to play. Um, and, the, and again, an audience getting un, un, unruly, they sent a limo across town and got Furry Lewis. I was in the audience on the field. My friend had gone to get Cokes, like, three hours ago and I had my back to the stage looking for him when I heard Furry Lewis on stage and I remember having this epiphany you know like turning around and going what is that and there was something about 
this older black man. And I don't think his race was really that important at that moment, but it was an older man with an acoustic guitar, as I recall. And that was it, just an old man and a, and a guitar. And he started telling these funny jokes and playing these songs. And he won over, you know, that, that hot, agitated crowd. And, and, and I left there more, much more impressed by Ferry Lewis than, than, than the Stones because it opened up the idea that these blues players, I was familiar with blues, you know, but it just hadn't occurred to me that they were alive and in town. But it was a shut off world to me. It was available to the Stones and not to me until about a year later at my high school, MUS, um, somebody brought Furry Lewis out to perform on the porch at lunchtime and a hat was passed so we, he could have some money. And, um, and, I, and, and I was like, how did that happen? You know, how did the opening act for the, <laughs> to me, it was, how did the open, opening act for the Rolling Stones appear at my high school? And I got his phone number from an upperclassman and I called him up and Furry invited me over and a little bit about Memphis in the, uh, what would that have been, you know, middle, late 1970s, it was easier for me as a 15 year old to buy the bottle of booze that Furry asked for than it was to get a ride to his house. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, that sort of, I mean, early in the book, and this is in the original, not not something new, you sort of write, you know, Memphis, is, Memphis has always been a place where cultures come together to have a wreck. Yeah. And, and that the soundtrack to these, uh, and more than the soundtrack to these con- these confrontations, it's a document of it. I mean, that idea, I mean, you, you, you were sort of, you were experiencing personally in the, in the, you know, these anecdotes you started the book with sort of a new version of what had happened before and what had happened since. And a lot of sort of what's happening in the book, right. With this, you know, white interest in black culture and the the connections that come when these things sort of collide together. Um, I, I think there was all, there's always been sensitivity around that. And, and, yeah. and, but if anything, maybe it's grown more fraught in the decades since, um, you know, the, the first chapter is called The Dream of a Common Language. I mean, in terms of you thinking about sort of the fruits of these collisions and the complications of it, like, like did, did, your, did your thinking about that change or how much did you for, sort of have to reconfront those ideas when you, when you revisited the book? It, it was ongoing at the time, and I document it in a few places in the book, and it's ongoing now, of course. Um, but, you know, one of my favorite anecdotes about that and and it's in the book because it was something that was happening to me while I was writing the book was I was working for a documentary you know a documentary would come to town and I would often be the uh the front man who would arrange the interviews and that kind of thing um and so on this one shoot two very interesting things happened one was they wanted to interview R- Rufus Thomas um and and I had told this documentary filmmaker you know, look, you got to pay for interviews. And he said, oh, I've never paid for an interview in my life. And, and I said, well, you know, either, either find someone else to help you, or you got to pay for, for the interviews. Because in my, in my opinion, you know, the, the publicity that this film was going to offer to these older blues artists had no material value. You know, they weren't touring much. They weren't, they weren't collecting royalties. They were being ripped off by, you know, any recordings that they had out there. So it wasn't going to do them any good personally. And it wasn't going to, like I told the guy, they've got a heating bill, man. You know, they, these people need to pay for their heat and you need to pay them an honorarium for their time. They're giving you your time. They're giving you their time. And in exchange, you need to pay. And so that was the first big thing on, on the documentary was standing up for that. We had this argument and the guy and the guy agreed to pay and he got up and walked and we were at, at the public eye in Oden Square and he got up and walked to the new French Quarter Inn. It was the second most expensive hotel in town at the time. And the irony of that, of like this guy not wanting to pay and yet staying in a, you know, in a, in a, in a fancy place really ate at me. So I wrote, I wrote about that incident in the book. And real quick, the other, the other great thing was now he's agreed to pay. So he's going to pay a hundred bucks to everybody. So I call... Rufus and he says, he says, uh, now you said you pay a hundred bucks, right? I said, yeah. He said, okay, well, I'll do it for 200. I said, said, well, Rufus, you know, they're paying a hundred. 
And um, it was really difficult for me to get the guy to agree. And, and what he said is they're going to pay a hundred. And he goes, uh huh, uh huh. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll do it for two hundred. And <laughs> it goes back and forth. And all of a sudden, I realized, wait a minute, man. Why am I telling Rufus Thomas that he doesn't get two hundred bucks? He wants two hundred bucks. I'm going to go back to the guy and tell him, if you want to interview Rufus Thomas, <laughs> right, you got to pay right. two hundred bucks. And, and that was a real awakening for me. Um, we, that is all the time we have this week, but Robert and Chris are going to stay. We're going to do a second part of this interview that will air next week on WYXR on the sidebar, uh, 91.7, next Thursday at 1130. Uh, this episode and that the, the next episode will be on the WYXR site or on the down uh, the Daily Memphian site or wherever you get your podcast. Thanks. Again, I'm Eric Barnes. And again, join us for the second part of this interview next week at 1130. <laughs>depth journalism in the Memphis community. The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.